it's really easy to get down in those moments. And for me, I just remember the level of competitiveness that not just me, but all of us had on that team is unmatched, is unmatched. Kip Balk Knight's name is synonymous with Gamecock baseball excellence. He was there in 2000 for a record-setting team that he feels like began the tradition that this program is now known for. On this edition of Gamecock Talk, we sit down with one of Gamecock baseball's all-time greats, whose recent recognition is just one of many amazing stories he'll be able to tell his two youngsters about. You are getting your jersey retired. First off, welcome to the show, and second off, congratulations. Thank you, Derek. It's um, glad to be here. Glad to share this moment with you, and uh, to, to have my jersey retired just means everything to me. To be able to share that moment with my parents and wife and two boys and all of my family and, and friends and, and a lot of former teammates is going to be a special night. I, I certainly... Um, uh, would be lying if I said I never thought about it and dreamed of it, but uh, you know, I, I just hope this is a springboard to see a lot more names out there because the history of South Carolina baseball and the amount of talent that's come through here, there's a lot more that deserve it, and I'm just truly honored and blessed uh, for this to this day to be here. You're still very much involved with the program. Obviously, folks see you on the television broadcasts on SEC Plus. You live locally you grew up here but uh, there was a period of time where you were playing professional ball and i don't want to say you were disconnected but you certainly couldn't have been as connected as you are now uh, what's it like to be still around this program as much as you are is that is that something that still gives you some level of excitement oh it does i mean honestly it's uh for me i just try to to be a blessing to others i try to do anything I can to talk to the, the current pitchers or any of the players. And I, I obviously keep in touch with the staff a lot. And it, it means the world to me that they welcome me back. They, they want me here. And, um, you know, I've talked to the team many a times over the last several years under Coach Kingston. And, uh, you, you know, when I was playing professionally, Derek, you know, Coach Tanner was always, even when Coach Holbrook was here, it was always welcome arms to, to be here, work out be a part of the program and it's uh it, it means the world i've got two boys now case and something they're 11 and 9 and they feel like they have the run of the place so they love it they 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 you know they love the scooby snacks in there that wingo hooks them up with and they just they think it's something it's a, it's a special place let's talk about where it all began for you because uh, this ballpark is just across the bridge basically from the school where you played high school baseball and, uh, and and kind of first became a known commodity uh, around Columbia. Um, take us back to the pre-Gamecock years and where baseball became your thing. Well, I played baseball, basketball, football, golf in the summer. I, I went to Brooklyn KC High School across the river. So I grew up a Gamecock and, uh, you know, from a baseball perspective, football was out by it was my junior season of high school i had my fifth concussion i was a quarterback and we did we uh quarterback and free safety we didn't have much of an offensive line or either i wasn't <laughs> fast enough Derek. i'm not sure but it was uh a lot of fun playing there my memories of playing basketball at brooklyn casey just you know we're a really good basketball program played for coach barry howell and, and coach ron sims who are, are very very special to me and enjoyed my time at bc and you know, baseball just kind of ended up being the thing that that I ended up excelling in most and didn't know what I was going to do. Didn't know if I was going to go to a lot of different other places. And, you know, I think one thing that sticks out for me is I went to a select camp at NC State in the ninth grade and uh, I was a shortstop. It was me and Michael Kadire, the shortstops and um, left there really heavily recruited as a shortstop. And Coach Tanner, I'll never forget, Coach Tanner and Coach Toman sent me a handwritten note once a week for the next four years wow. until coach tanner my senior year came to south carolina in his first year and uh, uh, made a huge impact on me and ended up 
coming to South Carolina and um, I guess the rest is history. So with that being the case, that obviously is going to get your attention uh, when you have a coach at a successful program spending that much time focused on recruiting you prior to Ray's decision to come here. Where were you in your own mind as far as what you wanted to do, where you wanted to play? Well, I grew up a Gamecock, but also grew up loving Florida State. I took an official visit there. They wanted me to play shortstop in center field and, and pitch, maybe. They didn't think I was uh, good enough to, to pitch on their staff. And, um, and then North Carolina was the other one. I loved Coach Mike Roberts. Of course, his son, Brian Roberts, was a shortstop my sophomore year here. They, they offered me a full scholarship to play shortstop. And, um, you know, that, and I love Coach Holbrook. He was the recruiting coordinator there. Uh, so I've known Coach Holbrook forever. Um, and, um, you know, it's kind of funny if I'd have known then what I know now about a six foot righty trying to make it to the big leagues, maybe some people say, well, you maybe made a mistake. And I'm like, no, I, I bleed garnet and black. I'm, I'm certainly glad that, that I came here at South Carolina and, and just had an amazing career. And, you know, for me, Derek, it's what, what the Jersey being retired means to me is I know for me, when I see Ray Tanner's number out there and I see Earl Bass's number, I immediately start thinking of that era and the teammates that Earl Bass had. Uh, you know, my dad grew up playing with Earl Bass. He was at Brooklyn Casey. My dad's in the Hall of Fame at, at BC as a great pitcher. And him and Earl used to go head to head in uh, Legion games, BC against the airport. So I know the, the, the type of player Earl was. Um, but for me, what's exciting is now this is all the fans that come to the games, they're going to go, oh, Balt Night 14. Well, then they're going to talk about the Scott Barbers, the Peter Bowers, the Tim Whitakers, the Nate Janowitz, the Mike Currys. You look at it, I had three pretty good shortstops in my career. Adam Everett, Brian Roberts, and Drew Meyer. Uh, don't know if there's another Gamecock pitcher that had three better ones than I did. I'm not sure how many college players, period, had three different shortstops during their career who all – we're at that level of elite. That's pretty amazing. It is amazing. And, you know, you think about this program and uh, what it has grown into in terms of the, the interest level that it has beyond just Columbia. But you just kind of focused on something I think was of interest there. You, Earl, you know, the local ties, the Columbia area ties, that's, that's something that, you know, has gone on for a lot of years here in this program. But when you have that kind of local talent have the success on the collegiate level and then getting beyond that, that, that really makes for a special relationship, I would think, with the fan base. Yeah, I think so. I felt like the fans were always amazing to me. They, they, um, I fed off of them. They gave me extra. I mean, I can remember the nights at Sarge Fry where you couldn't hear yourself think. And uh, it was a very uh, tough place, I feel like, for opponents to play. And uh, that's one of the things that I've been trying to help get and build at Founders Park to be able to get it. And I tell you what, this, these last two or three games at Founders Park have been pretty special. It's been very, very loud. And it makes a difference when you go on the road and you're pitching in the SEC and you're pitching at, as you've seen, the LSUs, the Mississippi States, the Arkansas. It can be extremely tough. And, um, you know, I felt like here was a little bit different at times. But uh, the fans just – Again, going back to, to me personally and how they treated me, they were just always great to me. And uh, being local, I think, helped, obviously. I think there were a lot of people that came on Friday nights to watch me because I was the local guy, and um, I fed off that. I loved it. I mean, it used to be a hassle with the pass list. I used to have to <laughs> to, to do fight and claw and, and borrow other guys' uh, tickets and everything, but it was a good problem to have. And I'm just so thankful for the support I had throughout my career. All right, take me back. You said that Ray was recruiting you initially as a shortstop. When did it become Kip Balk Knight pitcher? And, and when I say that, when did it become that in your mind that you were focused on, no, this is what I'm going to be? And, and when did the, the, the decision get made that, you know, from a collegiate standpoint, this is where your future lies? Well, you know, my freshman fall, um, Coach Tanner loves to tell this story. I think I had about an 18 ERA, but I, he never tells the story that I was facing like five All-Americans in the lineup. <laughs> I was having to face the starters. You know, I'm facing Ryan Bordenick, Derek Urquhart, Mike Curry, Adam Everett, you know, 
Adam Poe, the list goes on. And, um, and I was trying to hit two. I was trying to do both and didn't really have much success in the fall at both. So going into the, uh, before the spring season, Coach Tanner would always ask us to write a list down of what we think the lineup would be. And I put my name down as the number three starter. And of course he's like, Kip, uh, absolutely not. You uh, are the last guy that will come into the game. That's going into my freshman year. And uh, I, I went to him one day and I said, you know what? I said, I I'm just gonna focus on pitching. And I said, and I'm gonna prove you wrong. And I said, you will be watching me on Friday nights. And three weeks into the season, I got an opportunity to start on Friday night. I believe it was against Alabama and threw a complete game shutout. And then officially after that game, he said, no, no, it wasn't after that game. It was the next day I went to him and I said, hey, if you need a pinch hitter, I'm ready. You know, I'll be there. And he goes, boy, you might as well throw the bat and gloves away we gave you. You will never hit again. <laughs> Well, give him credit for recognizing and and, uh, and jumping on that. That's not surprising, no one, Ray. But uh, so when you talk about how did it evolve that quickly? How did you go from getting knocked around in the fall to getting an opportunity on Friday? Well, you know, I got opportunities, so I have to be thankful for that. I remember pitching in a game. I didn't even know if I made the travel squad. We were down in Charleston for a preseason tournament type deal, and I got in the game, and I think it was against Old Dominion. I think I threw an inning or two, gave up a solo homer, but pitched really well other than that. And then I got in again in a midweek game. And then I came in on Saturday and Sunday against Tennessee. And uh, just every opportunity I got, I just made the most of it. So um, while the opportunities were probably not going to be as much as the other guys got, I just happened to catch fire. And I believed in myself. I had faith in myself. And I knew that I was a lot better than what I had shown. And I think I learned how to ha handle my emotions better. I was a really a high emotional guy. And, um, you know, making an adjustment from high school to college is tough. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you know, Derek, I mean, there are guys that aren't able, ever able to do that. And uh, I was just able to, to figure it out. And, um, you know, playing for Coach Tanner, I had Coach Myers. Our coaching staff was amazing. And Coach Toman, you know, they just the, the mixture we had of having fun, being serious, being competitive, all those things just helped mold me into the, the, the player I ended up being. What did Jerry, you mentioned Jerry. Jerry Myers, a guy who, you know, quietly goes about his business, but was such a outstanding pitching coach for so long here in two different stints, really. What did you take away? Do you feel like if, if someone wanted to say, what'd you learn from Jerry Myers? What did he help you most with? A lot of things. I think one of the things that Coach Myers was extremely good at was trying to remember what the feel you had when things are going well. Remembering that feeling of what are you doing mechanically to be able to repeat it when you're doing well. And, you know, he's really, really big on repeating your motion and working quick. That was one of the things he hounded us on is not taking too long in between pitches working quick, keeping your defense on their toes. And then I would just say his calm demeanor, his calmness of not getting too high and too low. And he used to tell me all the time, you know, Kip, you are a high energy guy, but you got to know when to use it and be able to harness that. And, um, you know, it's, um, it, it, Coach Myers holds a special, special place in my heart. He was a wonderful mentor for me and, helped me throughout my career, and he was always a soundboard. I was a student of the game, so I loved to talk. Coach Tanner actually tried to, um, well, he did. He limited me to one, or he tried to. He limited me to one question a day, but I didn't <laughs> listen. Yeah, so, uh, but Coach Myers, Coach Myers was wonderful. All right, so, as you said, you're a student of the game. Your dad was an elite pitcher on, on that level. So, how much time did you two spend back then talking baseball um, because obviously a father-son relationship can can get into a lot of different things but how much were you two focused on baseball well you know I think first and foremost dad was focused on being a great dad and um for me that that meant everything to me that that he you know if I can be half the dad that my father was and is to me uh, I know I'm gonna be successful but um you know he he was he was hard on me, but he was hard on me 
because I wanted him to be. He wasn't the dad that pushed and pushed and pushed to where it would make me not want to play. Um, so, de you know, we would definitely talk about uh, things after my starts or things after um, games I played. And uh, again, I, I'm a high emotional guy. I can remember when I was in, we called it Pee Wee, minor league, uh, back when I was nine years old, he actually ended up videoing me because I was throwing my bat and having a bad temper. And, um, you know, so I, he had to, he had to discipline me a lot. And, um, but it, 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 it he, he had that fire. Um, I know that I got it from him. And, uh, you know, he just, uh, he was always, always teaching me to do the right things and play the game the right way and always put my team first. And uh, I, th I thank him all the time for that. You know, this year's team has had some pretty amazing success in terms of the records at certain times of the year. And every time one of them comes up, it seems like they're being compared to that 2000 team. You guys uh, set the SEC record for consecutive wins. Then you lost one or two. Then he went out and started another streak and set a new record, all in one season. I, uh, my buddy Tommy Moody always talks about just the unbelievable nature of that, that accomplishment. The you know, longest winning streak, yep, check. All right, well, let's go break it ourselves. What, what do you remember about that particular year, that team, and why it turned into what it turned into from a success standpoint? Well, you know, um, it, it starts with starting pitching. I think you can compare it to this year. It starts with guys that, that can get deep into games and can throw strikes. They're not walking guys. You know, we had Scott Barber, Peter Bauer. And Scott Barber, unsung hero. I mean, he texted me the other day. He's from, lives in Cincinnati. I, he can't make it tomorrow night, unfortunately. But, uh, I mean, a guy that closed on Friday and sometimes Saturday and would start on Sunday, I mean, Wow. I mean, the year he had 10 plus wins, 10 plus saves in one season, incredible. But that year, we loved playing the game. We loved winning. We didn't care. We, we, we believed in each other. We made it a point that every single player on that team had a purpose. And we would just make up things. And I think it's very similar. I had a moment yesterday talking to um, – Oh gosh, uh, Jack Mahoney and Jack Mahoney's just sharing stories about this year's program and this year's team and how they're everybody's having fun. And the last guy on the bench is one of the most important players on the team. And just talking about how, uh, you know, they, they embrace that. And that is the difference. That team for me started South Carolina's culture mm -hmm. and it continued for a long, long time. And this year, they finally gotten it back. And some will say, oh, Kip, this team's really talented. And our team in my junior year, 2000, we were really talented. But I think there were a lot of teams that were more talented than us. But we loved winning more than them, and we wanted it more. And we were willing to sacrifice, and we were willing to practice hard. And these guys embraced the challenge. And there, no moment's too big for them. They enjoy each other, and it's really, really fun to watch. You know, I think it's unique you bring that up because I, I recall in 2011, after that national championship and having that conversation or basically just being a fly on the wall, but listening to the coaches have that conversation and uh, Chad Holbrook laughing about all the teams from North Carolina that had come to Omaha that were better than that South Carolina team. But that South Carolina team was the one that won it all and didn't lose a game on, you know, on the way there. And sometimes it's not just about, uh, you know, raw talent it's it's how a team comes together yeah and you know Derek, looking back at the national championships uh, you know 2010 2011 it's arguably that i don't know if south carolina was the best team in those series and, and uh but the best team is not just about talent the best team is about selflessness and that's what i've seen so far this year with the south carolina team and that's what i know we had in 2000 and it's something for me that word hits a nerve for me and it, it's it, I'm very passionate about it because you know Michael Jordan said it best individual accolades come when your team is successful and I'm here today and my jersey's being retired and I'm extremely honored and humbled but I know that's not possible without the great teammates I had and if we didn't all play for the name on the front of that jersey and not the back this would have never been possible Get me back to 2000 now when you talk about that season. What stood out to you as you put together the amazing year you had, uh, you know, on the way to winning the National Player of the Year Award? Obviously, you did a ton of winning, uh, had a lot of 
days on the mound where you were just dominant. What do you remember about individual performances, any, anything in particular that season, any, any games or anything about that year that just stands out to you? You know, I hate to say it, but I remember that loss, probably the worst at <laughs> SEC tournament uh, against Kentucky. But I think that, you know, we lost six to four. I didn't have a great start. We hit two or three balls to the warning track that we thought were out. And, uh, you know, I think back to later that year after the season was over and I was out in Vegas and I, I get my Golden Spikes Award and I got to meet Greg Maddox. And I'm like, how do you win 15 plus games, 15, 16, 17 years in a row? And he's like, well, Kip, you know, you get 30, 35 starts a year, 10 of them, you're going to have your best stuff, maybe, maybe five to 10. Those are going to be pretty easy wins. He said, the other 10, you're probably going to have it couple pitches, you know, you might have the curveball in the first through the third, but it's going to go away in the fourth, fifth, and sixth. He says, but the way I win 15 or more games is those 10 games that I don't have anything, I figure out a way to win five of those. And for me, that's what I always wanted to be. I always wanted to be a guy that could win six to five or one to nothing. Because it's really easy when everything's going well, Derek. When everything's clicking, your defense is making plays, you got an umpire that you, you, you want that call, well, well, you get it. What happens? How can you handle that adversity? How can you give up four in the first and still win five to four? And uh, I, I, I took that mentality throughout the rest of my career. And uh, I remember in the minor leagues, I'll never forget, I threw five pitches and was down four to nothing. Try to do that one. <laughs> that was tough. That was in Little Rock, Arkansas. And uh, ended up pitching eight innings and we won five to four. And, uh, you know, that's just – that for me is uh, – it's really easy to get down in those moments. And for me, I just remember the level of competitiveness that not just me, but all of us had on that team is unmatched. It's unmatched. The Golden Spikes Award um, puts you in incredibly unique territory. You know, one of one. Every year, there's only one person that gets recognized in that regard. Do you remember the lead up to that? Was it on your radar? You know, did you have a feel for whether or not were you were you the clear front runner? I mean, you had an amazing year, what seventeen and one, but was it understood or was it unknown before you found out? Well, you know, Derek, it, that was before Twitter. It was before uh, I had a did not have a cell phone. Um, I do think the internet was out, <laughs> but uh, showing my age a little bit, but. Um, no, I had no idea. I mean, uh, you know, I was destroyed when we didn't make it to Omaha, losing three to two uh, against Lafayette. You know, just I'll never forget laying in the bed on a Friday night after beating Lafayette. You know, I just think we're going, we're in, and uh, didn't make it. But um, I, you know, I can remember Coach Tanner saying, "Hey, we got to go out to Vegas. You might win a you know the Golden Spikes Award." And kind of funny story, I ended up going, getting the elevator that night. It was with the Players Choice Award, so that was where. I mean, I met Evander Holyfield, Greg Maddox, you know, tons of famous folks that uh, were, were uh, way more talented than me. And I was just a lucky guy to be there. But um, I was in the elevator and Harold Reynolds came in with my then fiance. Um, yes, yeah, she was my fiance then, uh, now wife, high school sweetheart, D. And um, he said, well, hey, Kip, congratulations. I said, well, thanks, Harold. And I'm thinking, how in the world do you know who I am? And he's like, man, he goes, you should be real proud. He goes, you won, man. He said, be happy or whatever. And I was like, and he's like, you don't know. And I said, no, Harold. And he goes, <laughs> you better not ever tell anybody that. So um, anyway, sorry, Harold. Statue it's out. of limitations is over. <laughs> it's You're, over. HR will live with yeah, it, I'm so, sure. But I mean, to be in that, you know, even to be in the finalist for that, I mean, was amazing. I mean, it was, uh, so it, it was it was pretty pretty special moment. Well, you brought it up, so I'll go there. Let's go back a bit to when the season ended for you guys. You know, R Ray hadn't been to Omaha at that point. Of course, no one on that team had, and that's always the goal. And everybody in this sport, that's where your season begins is the dream of going to Omaha. That's part of what makes it so special is everybody has that same goal in mind. You guys absolutely knew you were capable and uh, one of the most qualified teams to be there. What do you remember about that that Lafayette series besides what you've already shared? And how, how much does that still enter your mind? A lot. I, uh, because that that team and, and, you know, just with our pitching staff, I just felt like we had a – I thought I just, it was the perfect team. Uh, you know, just um, – I'm just so thankful and so glad for our program that 
and you get rid of Kip in 01 and 02, boom, they go to Omaha, 02, 03, 04. My buddies Aaron Raw and Garrett Sconce remind me, and Brian Triplett remind me of that all the time. So, uh, but um, I just, uh, I'm so thankful that we have been able to get there and we've won national championships. I think one of the things that comes to mind for me is sometimes when you want something so bad, maybe you, maybe we pressed a little that, that weekend. You know, Saturday, Bauer had probably his worst start of the year, just a bad start. You know, uh, all, all of us obviously had him. And, um, and then Scott Barber pitched on Sunday, and we lose three to two. You know what I mean? We hit several balls hard. It just didn't work out. But why didn't it work out? Maybe we did press that day. I can remember, I can remember feeling the moment, and I wasn't even playing in the game that day. I can remember feeling the nerves and feeling the moment that day, and, and that disappoints me because I look at it, and I go, you know what, did I do enough as a teammate that day to try to snap us out of it, um, but still hurts. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure those are hard to get past. You and uh, Peyton Manning, that's how you always want to remind people, hey, Tennessee won the national championship the year after Peyton was gone. It doesn't tarnish what he meant to that program, and obviously the same for you. But I'm sure those guys who were your teammates and got to go, that had to be a bit of a – a tug on you that next year while that was going on? Well, you know, I, I can remember I was in Salem, Virginia, uh, high with the Rockies, and I can remember I was, luckily I was starting and I was in between starts, so I was in the stands doing the radar gun, and I can remember calling my dad and getting him to play the radio through the phone and listening to uh, what I remembered. It, it, you know, obviously we won, but I can remember, God, there were some good breaks there with some wild pitches or pass balls that helped us. And I'm just, I'm just thinking, gosh, wish we'd have gotten one of those breaks. But um, man, it was just, I was thrilled. So happy for Coach Tanner and 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 all the staff and the players. Just uh, what what a great run it was. Um, pro ball for you. Uh, what's that experience like? I mean, it, nowadays they're finally starting to. Talk about paying guys a living wage. Back then, it was romanticized by those who never did it. And those who experienced it probably had a different story to tell to some degree on what it was like, especially after you'd pursued it for you know multiple years. Yeah, nine and a half years, Derek. It was a long time. I spent, you know, parts of six, six and a half years in Dublin and AAA and you know, just never wasn't in God's plan for me to make it. And uh, certainly wasn't from a lack of training or trying, just didn't work out. But uh, it, it was, I embraced it. I mean, you pay to play. I mean, I can remember my first paycheck was 300 and something bucks every two weeks. And that was before, you know, uh, paying for rent and paying for everything else. I mean, it was, you know, I was in AAA. I was one of only, we, there was one other guy that had not been to the big leagues, so we were making twenty one hundred bucks a month, and I think my rent was twenty four hundred bucks a month. So uh, it was um, it, it was a lot of fun, though. I learned a ton. I mean, I learned a ton. You know, I lived with Matt Holiday for three years. We were road roommates. We were playing PlayStation the night he got called up, and we were in Memphis, Tennessee, and he hugged me, and I'm still hurting from that hug because he's a beast. And uh, it, 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 was, it was a lot of fun to see guys' dreams come true. And, um, you know, again, it, it just, uh, you know, the tough thing I think for me is, you know, I look back, my junior year I was drafted by Oakland, and uh, that was Billy Bean. And, um, you know, they called me in the sixth round that year and um, they asked me, said, hey, will you sign for 50 in school? And I said, no. I said, 75 in school, I will, which, of course, now it sounds like that's not a lot of money. Back then that was a lot of money. I felt like that was enough to where they have money invested in me. And, um, well, they never called back. And uh, that broke my heart. It was destroyed. Uh, the next day I said, I'm going to play golf. Coach Tanner said, no, 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 somebody's going to draft you. Well, Oakland ended up drafting me. And I'm like, well, you know, that's fine. I'm coming back to school. And Coach Tanner did something I'll never forget. He said, son, he said, they might come back. He said, we're not, you're not announcing you're coming back to school. He said, we're not doing that. He said, we're going to wait. They might come back. He could have easily said, you know, Kip, go ahead and let's make the announcement. Well, I made the announcement, I think it was the same day, maybe or day after I got engaged. And um, um, they called on Sunday and we started school on Thursday. The, the uh, guy that drafted me thought the school started on Monday and uh, they had $150,000 for me to sign and uh, tried to get me to lie and say I'd come back and, or, you know, that I didn't go to class. And I said, no, I'm, I've made my mind up. And 
you know, but thinking about that from an Oakland standpoint, a Billy Bean standpoint, a Moneyball standpoint, um, what I made it to the big leagues with them, you know, you never know because we didn't make that choice. But, um, you know, that things could have been different for me. But um, I'm so thankful for, for coming back and graduating and, uh, and, you know, spending my four years here is the best four years of my life. How hard was it when, when you finally decided to, to hang up the spikes? How challenging was it to get to that decision? Extremely difficult. Um, you know, I'd gotten released in 09 by the Phillies. I was in double A Reading, and then I ended up, or 08, and then I went in 09, played with former teammate Brett Jody uh, at Somerset uh, with him and Sparky Lyle, uh, former Yankee. And Fox Buyer was on that staff as well. And uh, and then I had an opportunity to go play the next year with um, the um, – I can't even remember what it was. I think it was the um, – I'm not sure. I was either going to go to Korea or go to the Reds, I believe it was, in AAA. And um, my wife and I were ready to start a family. Yeah, I was 32. Uh, but giving up was something I'd never done. And, and I gave up. I, I, I retired. I was still healthy enough to do it. I think I could have pitched till I was 45 years old if I wanted to. Uh, but um, I just felt like it was time. I was tired of the grind. I was tired of, just felt like it, it just wasn't meant to be. And um, I still have dreams about it. And it, it still is a, um, it's a tough adjustment. I think it's something that's not talked about enough. I think there needs to be, um, you know, life after something you've been doing your whole life is extremely difficult uh, mentally. It really, really is. And, uh, but the way that this program welcomes me back and allows me to be a part of it is very special to me. I would imagine those two youngsters probably help you. They do. Keep keep you occupied and not do. worried about those things too. Oh, they do. They keep popping check and um, they are they're the light of my world. Are, are you got, got any future pitchers in, in that group? Well, believe it or not, Derek, they're both left-handed. Oh, wow. They both are left-handed. And they're like, Dad, why weren't you left-handed? I'm like, I don't know. I kind of wish I was. I might have made a little <laughs> bit of money, but... Uh, yeah, they're both left-handed. They play baseball, basketball, football, golf. They they love. They're great students, great kids. I'm extremely blessed. My wife is uh, an amazing mom, and um, they're they're uh, they're good little athletes. All right, so you've got the unique combination here, being TV analyst, and you're going to be out getting the uh, you know the pregame treatment. Are, are you going to try and do, I hadn't thought about this. Are you going to try and do TV that day too? Or is there just too much going on in your head and your heart to even think about walking back after the ceremony and saying, okay, I'm going to go put on a headset now and talk to Dave for a while. Well, I tell you, you know, I, I'm going to miss Dave. Um, I'm not doing the game, uh -huh. but it's, it's not by my choice, which I'm extremely glad. Coach Tanner offered, he said, Kip, you know what? I'll do the game for you. You sit back and watch it and enjoy it with your family and former teammates and friends. And uh, uh, that means the world to me. I think Coach Tanner would do a better job than I would do <laughs> every day. But um, um, I, that meant the world to me that he's going to do that for me. And um, didn't give me a choice. Kind of like when he took the bat away from me. He just said, hey, you're not doing the game that night. I'm going to do it. And uh, that that's uh, not surprising. First class. Just an amazing, amazing man. He, and we'll, we'll end with that. I want your, your thoughts on your lifetime of experience working with him in terms of he knew you when you were a kid, recruiting you, and obviously coached you through some amazing years, and then you've stayed. I know very much view him as a mentor to this day. Coach Tanner means the world to me. Coach Tanner is a, a second father to me. He is, um, he is everything that, this baseball program is about. Um, truly honored and blessed to be able to have played for him. He brought out the best in me. Uh, we had many a great moments, many a moments where we said our choice words to each other, but that's what made us great, I feel like. He just, he didn't put up a wall that, he did to some that were scared to say things to him, but I never was, and he knew it. And um, I felt like we just got the best out of each other. And um, he just, um, he always knew the right things to say, how to say them, and uh, always kept me grounded. And um, he just, um, not, 
not enough words to describe my feelings for Coach Tanner. He's just, uh, his whole family is wonderful. Uh, he's been meant the world for this baseball program. And uh, again, I, I'm just so, so happy that I chose to be a Gamecock and I'll be a Gamecock forever. Well, it took us long enough to get this thing scheduled. As it turns out, it's perfectly timed. Good luck with everything, with the ceremony. We'll be watching, we'll be enjoying it and, and uh, kind of living through you as you go th through a very, very unique experience uh, at this ballpark. Well, thank you, Derek. One last thing I would like to say for me, uh, and I haven't said this to the fan, to the players yet, but I will. Um, tomorrow night is going to be a special pregame ceremony. It's going to be a special night for me. But tomorrow night, the Gamecocks play the Tigers, and at seven o'clock, it's not about me. It's about our players, and I'm going to make sure they know that. And uh, I want them to enjoy the ceremony. I want them to look at that number out there and maybe inspire them to one day be on that wall, but I want them to stay focused because last I checked, the fans are coming to watch the team and they're coming to watch the players, and I want to keep it that way. Leave it to this guy to always have his game face on on a Friday night. Kip, we appreciate it. Thank you, Derek.